Hello, everyone. I'm joined um, again by Richard Lucas, leader of the Scottish Family Party, a, a very fine party um, that, that we can all learn a lot from. Um, our, our, our guest today is a guest is is um, is Professor Jared Casey, and you've hopefully just watched his presentation. He's also the author of a couple of wonderful books, Hidden Agenda, um, from which he was drawing for his talk, and also After Me Too, which is an outstanding book that he drew on for last year's presentation. So um, he basically writes a book a year, so as he gets <laughs> so as he gets on here, and it's it's working so far. Um, um, very warm welcome, Jared. And um, I, I wonder, Richard, if you could if you could kick us off with that interesting question you thought of earlier. Yes, uh -huh. this is a question I think should be asked a lot more often. So we'll take the opportunity to ask it here. Uh, so, Gerald, do you think that the 2004 Gender Recognition Act should be repealed? Absolutely, yes. And all its works and pumps, the whole lot. Mm -hmm. Yes. Do you think it's bizarre that it passed with so little public controversy? In one sense, yes. But given the way things have gone over the last 40 to 50 years, no, uh, there, are, there are reasons for why it is that it has happened. I mean, we had a similar thing happen in Ireland. Our, our act is 2015. And I, I would take a bet on it that almost nobody except those people like myself who are interested in it actually even know that it exists. Mm -hmm. It sort of was, you know, it was done at three o'clock in the morning when nobody was watching. Yeah. But it actually could have been done in broad daylight and nobody would have noticed it either. That's the extraordinary thing. The extraordinary yeah. thing is how ordinary the idea that you can change your sex has become. Mm -hmm. It's astonishing. Yeah. I wonder if, I mean, not, not only for um, for UK um, people, but you know, most, it's an international conference. So, so I wonder if, if um, Jared, you could you could take us through that act and what what the ramifications of it were. Well, the well, first of all, uh, the first thing to notice about it is its name. It's called the Gender Recognition Act. And uh, if you're like most people, then you think, oh, gender, sex, they're, they're the same thing, aren't they? I mean, it's just one of these sort of linguistic things. Some forms have sex on it and some have gender. And it's all the same thing. And the answer is, well, yeah, sometimes it's the same and sometimes it's not. OK, and depending on how you... Uh, conceptualize these things, you can have a million genders if you want, and who cares? It's like hairstyle, right? But if you're talking about sex, there are only two sexes. And so there's this systematic obfuscation <laughs> that is used in those two terms. And what's really interesting about the 2004 Act and the corresponding 2015 Act in Ireland is that in the, in the relevant section, it says something like, if a person's gender is in a person and then gender is in a gender and then a gender and gender and gender, then their sex shall be the female sex and their sex shall be the male sex. And right at the end of a whole passage of genders, we've suddenly transitioned from gender to sex. Now, this has to be the greatest sleight of hand and this is either a staggeringly incompetent piece of legal draftsmanship. <laughs> okay. Or it's quite deliberate. And, you know, what my father used to say, well, you know, when you come across something really, really crazy, assume that it's the result of stupidity and not malice. OK, <laughs> I'm trying to think that this is not stupidity, that it is actually malicious and it's quite bizarre. And you're absolutely right. It, it, it's astonishing. It's done, I would imagine. It, it's it, it's brought about in the way that most of these things have been brought about uh, in the last 20 years through an excess of sentimentality. We feel sorry for people in particular situations and we think we've got to do something and we don't want people saying nasty things about them and being rude to them and doing all of these things. And therefore we pass a law. Now, the trouble with passing laws is that laws have effects. And I'm all in favor of being nice to people. I'm all in favor of not being nasty to people. But the problem, as I tried to make it clear in my book, Hidden Agenda, is that I'm not really concerned whether somebody, you know, George wants to call himself Georgina. That's... I, I think it's weird, but hey, it's a big world. It's just when I'm forced through law and legal means and others as well to actually subscribe to what I regard as a lie, which is that a man is a woman or a woman is a man. That's when it gets problematic. 
And that's the that's the real issue. And that's where loss of teeth. And so the Gender Recognition Act, so-called, which should be called the Sex Recognition Act, together with equality legislation, um, are together, it's a potent mixture. It becomes explosive. And we're, we're going to see it. Um, it I, I seem to remember reading in the paper where, um, oh, yeah, one of the, <laughs> so here's the thing. Um, if you extend the ban, uh, you know, sorry, conversion therapy, right? Which is, which is this idea was uh, the banning conversion therapy came up in the, in the context of homosexuality, right? And people who are homosexuals. And the transgender people want this extended to transgenderism. And the problem with all that is that if I'm a parent and my six-year-old girl thinks she's a boy and I don't immediately conform to this, Am I engaging in a, a form of conversion therapy and I'm now going to be uh, uh, made amenable to legal uh, sanctions, if that's the case? And indeed, that this is a real issue because this has come up in Parliament. <laughs> we just want to make an exception for parents that are going, if you've got yourself into this bizarre situation, there's something really fundamentally wrong with what you've been doing up to now. It's time to realise it. Indeed, indeed. Very good point. A um, question from Chris Voti. Um, he says, I, I feel this need for transgender fight is a means to erase men and get them to become women. Instead, uh, instead, however, it's hurt women by taking away their privileges, such as sports. Uh, uh, any thoughts on this? Well, yes, it, it's um, it's it's a in the larger scheme of things, it's a strategic move on the way to render our society totally androgynous. And. Um, I mean, the, the fantasies we've now seen uh, quite recently in the Olympics mm. and, and the, the notorious swimming case just broke up, I think, about a week ago, where this chap who was in the in American university swimming mm. on the male team for three years suddenly decided he was transgender and now, astonishingly, is, is winning all around him. This was reported in The Guardian, by the way, with, permanently, with a perfectly straight face. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's like, uh, you know, I... I'm, I, you know, I'm like, you know, 14 stone and I beat up a three stone kid. Well, yeah, that's <laughs> it's hardly yeah, yeah. surprising. It's, it's quite bizarre. But uh, I can remember it well, must have been five or six years ago. I was on the radio here in Ireland and uh, and I was in this context talking about this issue when it wasn't anything like as large as it is now. And I made the point that one of the consequences would be that I said something like, you know, the, the the tennis player ranked 300 the male tennis player ranked 350th in the world could put on a dress and turn up for Wimbledon and win and everybody said oh you're at it again you're exaggerating this is ridiculous don't even think about that yeah and I'm waiting for this to happen now what's the well, stop it's, well indeed you know because the, the 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 I mean that's I think that's gone on for at least 10 years maybe even 15 at Wimbledon Absolutely ridiculous. Even if you look at the number of games and the quality and the sponsorship and all, all the rest of it. Um, but, you know, you wonder why um, te male tennis player 303 doesn't do exactly what you say. He's, you know, especially if he's maybe in his 20s, he, 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 he could earn a fortune, couldn't he? Absolutely. I mean, why not? And how can you stop him? Well, um, we have uh, Vernon Miggs asking, would you say that the trend of multiple arbitrary genders is an attempt to pretend to individuate while fearing let go of a, of a sense of collectivism? You're going to have to ask me that again. Sorry, that was a good... <laughs> would, would what? Um, I think I'll ask Vernon if you'd, if you'd like to, <laughs> to reword that and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll put it again. Um, uh, Tom, Tom Chadwick says, um, um, I'm interested, why is this a men's rights issue? If feminists don't like the transgender issue and they see it as a threat to the rights that women have won, female privileges, then why is it an issue for men's rights activists? Well, I think the reason is because, uh, like many family quarrels, many family, family quarrels only work because the people are in the same family. And, they, and, and feminists and transgenderists are fighting it out on a platform of a distinction between sex and gender which has been used uh, if, by the feminists up to date as the, one of the major weapons against men. And therefore, the, the, what, what, one of the things it does, and we've seen this in the way in which the uh, reactions of feminists to transgenderism, like uh, Kathleen Stock and others, get extraordinary prominence. And that normalizes 
the the uh, the points upon which the feminists and the transgender transgenderists agree, and it makes it even it makes it so normal because, like in any conversation, okay, we the things that we agree on don't appear if you like on the surface, and the things we disagree on are the ones that are focused on, and so it normalizes this distinction between sex and gender, which is key to the whole uh, feminist project, and that makes it relevant to men's okay. issues. Okay, just chip in as well. I, I think there's a potential danger to the men's right movement in the uh, in the transgender issue, and that's in that the, the feminists, the turf feminists, who are objecting to transgenderism, I'm sure almost of us would be saying, yeah, we're, we're on their side, if you like, within that family feud. But still, they're very hardline feminists. I think some of their attitude is driven by hostility towards men. They just can't bear the thought that a mere man could suddenly declare himself to be to be one of the chosen sex. I think, I think that's <laughs> underneath it. But the danger is you'll get many men of a more conservative persuasion who might listen to these feminists and think, yeah, well, they're, they're sort of on my side. And the danger is that they're going to start taking in some of their other beliefs. But think about it. If the men's rights movement was going to mirror feminism, then they would be saying that trans men, in other words, women who think they're men, men's rights activists would be saying, oh, no, you're not. You're not a real man. No, you, you, you haven't you know, been through the experiences we've had. No. So, so there will be the option. I've never heard anyone go down that line. <laughs> but if the men's rights movement was to mirror feminism, that's what they would be saying. I, mm -hmm. I'm not recommending that. I, I think that would be a bad move. But it's just interesting that there's, yeah. that there's no symmetrical response. There's no one objecting to people claiming that they've become a man. There's only people objecting to the claim that they've become a woman because being a woman's special. And don't you think that's interesting, since men are supposed to be so extraordinarily privileged? Mm -hmm. okay. Indeed. Well, you know, the men's rights movement um, will never want to mirror feminism, Richard. I, I can absolutely assure you of that. <laughs> uh, but it couldn't if it wanted to because of gynocentrism. But I mean, that, that's 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 for another day, possibly. Uh, Jared, you mentioned Kath uh, Professor, I always do this with feminists, Professor Kathleen S Scott or Stock? Stock? I think Stock, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, she, she and Julie Bindle seem to, uh, the articles by them in major newspapers and magazines seem to appear with monotonous regularity, complaining about being silenced. Well, <laughs> I, I, I wish we were silenced. I could do with a bit of that silencing. Um, yeah. it's, it, how, how, is it just sheer ne neck that, 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 that or, or, or just an expectation that, 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 that they're silenced more than they want to be silenced? It's, it's, it's an astonishing thing. It is quite extraordinary. It's it's like somebody who has been pampered from birth uh, and got everything she wants suddenly com complains about, you know, her father interfering with her life in some particular way. It's, it's quite extraordinary. Um, the feminists, by and large, have had a field to themselves. They have been the beneficiary mm -hmm. of public acclaim and, and uh, you know, and accepted and, and regarded in some sort of strange way. This is quite a bizarre thing, as if you like brave and fearless leaders, as if somehow they're going to be arrested or threatened in the morning if they, if they mm -hmm. instead of being lauded and being on talk shows and, and, and writing articles ad nauseum, literally ad nauseum. <laughs> and, uh, and now that they've been to some extent slightly outflanked, okay, by the transgenderists, they are suddenly thinking, oh my goodness, we can't speak, we're, we're, this is terrible. Which is, but what that really means is they are, there is now a group which relative to privileged than we are, okay? Yeah. And therefore, like people who complain about being poor, when what they mean is I have slightly less than somebody else. Yes. <laughs> okay, yeah. our feminists are in that position, yeah. Sh Sh Sean picks up on <clears throat> a comment you made earlier on. Um, um, so he says, a totally sexless, androgynous world, as predicted by George Orwell in 1984. Such a world would inevitably be miserable. So much of life's joy coming from vive la différence. Oh, yeah, vive. Indeed, um, the extraordinary thing is uh, that despite almost 50 years of feminism and 10 more or less full-on years of transgenderism, the mass, the mass of people are still solidly quote unquote, sexist. I just noticed that I was coming home from town the other day and it was the beginning of the evening and I noticed all these young women all dressed up for going out. 
all made up and wearing, you know, slightly fewer clothes than I found you know, proper. But there we are. And I, I was thinking, you know, who's forcing you to do this? What malign force is making you do this? And I'm going, no, because they're they're doing what they've always done and presumably always will do. And the men are doing the same sort of thing. And I even saw I was I was channel hopping the other night uh, and saw some advertisement for one of these ghastly uh, live for what you call it uh, reality programs where one of the, having to do with the, where they put men and women together in some environment. And one of the women was saying, I want a proper geezer. And I'm thinking, well, that's not an expression we use in this country, but I presume it means something like a real man, somebody who's manly, okay, somebody who will ignore me in the way that I should be ignored. <laughs> Indeed, and indeed. so most people are there, but nonetheless, they don't realize the way in which the movers and shakers and the people who make policy and so on have has have been, if you like, captured by these ideologies. No, absolutely. And that's really surprising. And I, I, I'm struck. I mean, I'm, I've just turned 64 and I, I, I'm struck, you know, if, if, if I happen to see sort of young women um, go into a bar or something, they're, they're dressed in a way that when I was a teenager or even young man, one would absolutely assume them to be prostitutes uh, yeah but well, uh, that was um, i was thinking of saying that but i thought better of it <laughs> well you know me i i'm uh, I, I, <laughs> you can always rely on me to say what others don't want to jared um okay a question here from a guy called rod lonsdale who's the most amazing campaigner at speaker's corner and so on um uh, just a wonderful guy you, and he's, he's got to talk later Excellent. he says um did feminists not create this nonsense St stating gender is a, is a social construct. Feminists have taken over every male created space. Our first and second wave feminists not being chased by their own Frankenstein monster in a, in a frock. I love it. I have no empathy for feminists and women who have benefited from all their vicious misandry. Do you think, do you not think it's all well deserved? Is it not just gynocentrism? Uh, the answer is yes. Um, so on on when I was talking about my my later book on on the hidden agenda, one of the people there uh, wondered why I was being so unkind to feminists, and uh, I because this wasn't the Me Too book, so I had to try and reply and say that what you're seeing in transgenderism is the logical uh, outcome of the distinctions which were made. Uh, by the not so much the first, but certainly by the second, the subsequent generation of feminists. And therefore, that's one of the reasons why they're so hostile <laughs> is because they feel that their, their armor has been stolen, yeah. as it were, mm -hmm. and they've been outflanked. But yes, <clears throat> and so it, that's why, uh, while I have a certain sympathy for feminists, it's a, it's a very small amount of sympathy and it's relative. Uh, and as I say uh, in the piece that I've just uh, that's just got up, to see a 61-year-old woman being smacked in the face by a man wearing a skirt uh, is for me on a human level, uh, it is distressing. But really, you know, in, a, in one sense, if you were being unkind, you, you could say, well, you know, they've brought it on themselves. You, you sow the wind and you reap the whirlwind. And Indeed. that's what they've done. Um, Chris, Chris Voti points to Terence White, who's also a speaker at this conference, um, asking or stating, the Istanbul Convention defines gender without reference to sex, i.e. man and woman can only be, be defined by stereotypes, then requires the eradication of gender stereotypes. Is there an <laughs> intentional international effort to eliminate the very concept of woman? Well, it would appear so. I mean, if, if, if there isn't, then this is happening without anybody intending to do it, which is quite bizarre. Um, and this is, we I mean, the feminists are correct in this, that when you, uh, when now, they're doing it from, as it were, a political perspective and to protect, as they see it, their hard-won rights uh, and so on. But nonetheless, if you, if, if you go down the road of transgenderism and you play the sex-gender two-step and you go back and forth between the two, as they systematically do, then in the end, there is no fixed point at which you can say that men are men and women are women because, and here the feminists are on a very sticky wicket because um, as again, I tried to make clear in, in my talk, when they're asked to define what a woman is, they either like those women at the conference in Washington can't say or bring themselves to say what a woman is, or they make being a woman, um, the outcome, of, sorry, they make being a woman somebody who has had certain contingent experiences of oppression. 
<laughs> and the problem so, with so, that so, is so so nothing subjective there then jared nothing subjective at all and the thing is it's quite bizarre <laughs> and as i point out of course you you can come up with a counter example you can come up with somebody whose brother was a princess and had everything given to her and so on and, and no experience no form of oppression and of course by the feminist standard this person wouldn't be a woman Yes. Okay, and so and, and let's imagine then the contrary. I know this is ridiculous for a feminist who's trying to visit a man. Imagine a man who has experienced what it's like to grow up in the world, say from about 1995 or 2000, where you're systematically oppressed, as we would see it, uh, in certain ways, not listed for jobs, not considered, uh, consistently denigrated in the media and advertisements and so on. And let's suppose we said that's what being a man consists in. I, I don't think we'd actually get very much sympathy and for good reason. That's not what being a man consists in. It's a contingent experience at this time in our history. And therefore, if as a feminist, you make contingent experience to be the mark of what it is to be a woman, then you, whether you like it or not, you've actually sold the past. And this is the dilemma in which they find themselves. Steve Moxon, the author of the amazing book, The Woman Racket, 2008. Well um, I, I don't book. know if you know that. But, oh, I think, yes, I think you have the same publisher. Jared, mm. don't you? We um, do. That, that's a fantastic book. It was the book that did more than anything to, to red pill me back, back, uh, back in the day. He says, um, so what's the next development of identity politics? Self-identified hermaphrodites. <laughs> th th these, these would be those aiming to be regarded as female, but with their own additional male sex organs, so they can continually and permanently F themselves, literally and metaphorically. <laughs> Uh, I love it. <laughs> this, this guy's very entertaining to have a beer with, let me tell you. <laughs> I um, can imagine. Uh, I wish I'd said that. <laughs> uh, uh, being them, sorry, being there by self-oppressors, the occasions for victim stancing would be on demand, whatever circumstances favoured playing the victim card. The perfect situation for an identity politics totalitarian. Yes, you could be both oppressor and oppressed at one and the same time and to the same degree. It's quite a, it's an extraordinary conception. I'll have to think about it. But yeah, it's look, where, where does one go in this? In in a way, whatever one, one might have thought, say, about feminism in first phase, uh, equality or at least non-discrimination against women in, in political and social matters. Well, fine. Again, uh, who's fighting that battle? Second wave, it gets a little bit different. And now we moved on to stick. And now when we get to transgenderism, our our contact with reality is so flimsy that the wheels are spinning and there is yes. really nothing here. And indeed, uh, as I point out the, the, in my, my analysis of the relationship between sex and gender, we go from the idea that sex is biological and gender is some kind of way of characterizing what the uh, uh, social norms are that people have for men and women, which you can make a case for if you wish, to the idea that at the extreme on the kind of on the uh, uh, butler butlerian extreme that gender is somehow and bizarrely um, what is characteristic of you it's a given it cannot be changed and efforts to change it are now regarded in the same way as conversion therapy or homosexuality and sex is somehow performative it's that is really strange so there's something we have called gender identity which is inborn innate it is what you really are i try to explore in some in a little superficial way i suppose uh the philosophical grounding of this and it really turns out to be a a sort of bastard version of platonism the idea that what you are is some kind of internal entity which is only contingently related to the corp corporal structure that you exhibit you might almost say what's a nice gender identity like you doing with a body like this <laughs> indeed, can indeed. I come in with some answer to the question as well about uh, what next for identity politics yes I, I think there's, there's a few more just popping up over the horizon oh lord uh, uh, autism uh, in the Scottish Parliament they talk about you know, autism spectrum cognitive spectrum and the idea is uh, that if say people who are autistic tend to be underrepresented in certain roles then there needs to be a quota. They talk about conversion therapy for autistic people. So, you know, you need to just say you're great the way you are rather than trying to help them develop skills. So there's that one. Uh, the children's rights movement is an identity politics movement. It's saying children are oppressed by adults. They need to be set free um, and given equality with adults. I think there's, a, there's an IQ identity movement. The idea, <laughs> if, if you're the sort of person who's not very good at exams, then it's really unfair that you're discriminated against. So we need a representation of all types of people. 
in society. Uh, and the last one, maybe the most serious, is um, basically paedophiles as well. Mm. I mean, the, there are moves, there are people who are, as part of the children's rights movement as well, they want to normalise uh, child, adult, sexual relationships, and they use the same sort of identity politics language as well, and, and especially through, the, through children's rights. Right. So, so that's my stab at four identity politics themes coming well, over the horizon. So watch this. Um, you've ruined um, my day, Richard. Sorry, Douglas comes up with another one. Uh, I don't know what prompted this. He's suggesting baldness spectrum disorder. I don't know where I, he got I, that from. I, I've made a video about that. <laughs> Look on the Scottish Family Party YouTube channel. Some, uh, some you, of you'll, us. You'll see the launch of a, what was it called? A bald awareness Scotland right. or something. Yeah. Well, well, Mike, you and I would agree that we are exceptionally privileged here. We are. In this, in this uh, area. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> it was free, put, free, the video free was two... published on April the 1st, 2018. Free, <laughs> free, free toupees for men and, you know, at the same time as free sanitary products for, for women. Um, we have to have gender equality. Um, um, my thanks to Vernon Migs for rephrasing his question. Um, do, in fact, and there's an allied one, which I'll add at the same time. Do transgenderists identify as a given arbitrary gender because they want to pretend to be more of an individual while at the same time clinging on to a group identity? And Sean G says another might be, and this is, this is another good point, how much of this is simple attention seeking? Oh, good question. OK, in regard to the first question, if I understand it, and I probably don't, let me put it this way. There's something very strange about people claiming to change sex while at the same time, if you like, subscribing to, it, to an ideology which makes the idea of their being another sex impossible. It's, it's, quite, it's quite bizarre. Why would you do it? doesn't make any sense you can only I mean in other words if you want to go to Edinburgh you can only go to Edinburgh if there's an Edinburgh to go to you can only change sex if there are different sexes <laughs> and they have to be clearly distinct um, whereas gender who knows what that means it means so many different things I, in fact I just I had to uh, go for a medical procedure and it had a question on it and it had gender and it offered me female needless to say first then male and then other so I scratched out gender okay and I put in male because I have no idea what other is and so on. Um, is it attention seeking? Very possibly. Uh, I don't know what's going on in the minds of people here. There's certainly something I would think to come back to a point that Richard was making in his in his four additional if you like possible routes of insanity in the near future. All of them involve somehow maybe for good intent maybe deriving from good intentions but who can tell they all subscribe to the inability to say that in relation to any given factor there is a norm and there are deviations from the norm all right so those who are stupid deviate from the norm of average intelligence by the way so do people who are super intelligent okay uh, those who for example are those who are autistic deviate from the norm of not being autistic. And now, now here is even to say this to invite people shouting at you and saying, oh, this is terrible, you're going to treat them. And I'm saying, no, 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 nothing follows from this about necessarily about how you treat them. But you do have to recognize this. And so let's take, uh, let's take, the idea of norm is actually very important. So if you were, uh, if you're a biologist or a zoologist and you're looking at, and you're talking about something, say like a dog and you're asked to characterize a dog, you would say dog is a four-legged animal. And somebody, the really, the, the annoying student in the class will put his hand up and say, well, hang on a second, in my area, there's a dog who has three legs. Does that not make him a dog? And the answer is, well, yes, it does. But a three-legged dog is a, from the point of view of the norm, a deviant dog, right? The norm is to have four legs. And the reason he doesn't have three legs is because he lost a leg in an accident or because of some developmental problem, gestational problem, he didn't develop a leg in the way that people do. It doesn't mean he's a bad dog. It doesn't mean we should kill him. It doesn't mean we should make <laughs> smart remarks about him, but he's not normal, right? And, and so all of the things that you, Richard, were talking about, again, the, these, these things, we have the idea of what a norm is. And, and it's true that in, when you get out to the extremes, you can find borderline cases, but nonetheless, clearly there's a big, you know, a dog with four legs and a dog with three legs. There's a leg missing, okay? And that's the idea. Of a norm. And we are increasingly reluctant to be, as the saying goes, judgmental. And that means we must not 
I, in fact, we're not at all uh, 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 unhappy to be judgmental. You just have to be judgmental about the right things, the things that are appreciated by the newspapers mm -hmm. and so on. You can be as judgmental as you like about those, but there's a whole range of things where you, where you at your peril, will say, will use the term normal. And, and that's a real problem. And we have all been, most of us feel the pressure sometimes even to self-censor uh, when we're talking about these things, because we know there's going to be a chorus of execration. We're going to be shouted at and screamed at and accused of all sorts of terrible things if we make right. those kind of comments. But I mean, there are some terrible consequences um, of, 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 of this sort of thing. I mean, I, I myself have noticed over the years that three-legged dogs are discriminated are discriminated against in employment terms as sheep dogs. I mean, I've never seen. <laughs> it's 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 appalling that they're. Um, I mean, I suppose they could be looking after three legged sheep, couldn't they? I mean, you know, we, we just need to be a bit more imaginative. Um, our, um, our good friend Steve Moxon comments, "What about us uglies? We are the most oppressed." <laughs> I don't know what he means by us. I, I take exception to that. Actually. Oh, you haven't seen his you haven't seen his photograph, have you? Oh no, no, no. Well, okay, okay, Steve, it's okay for you. <laughs> yeah, he's not. No, no, he's not. Well, obviously, he couldn't be including us. I mean, that's sort of obvious, really. Um, but there, but there again, the whole idea of discrimination. Uh, take that term. Um, so the the phrase now, which would be regarded, I suppose, as sexist, would be say a man of discrimination meant somebody who had a refined taste or ability to to distinguish between good wines and bad wines between good food and mediocre food and so on and that was a term of approbation mm, yes yes okay now discrimination has come has come to be almost uniformly negative right and therefore the drawing of any distinctions well that's to say distinctions of the wrong kind okay of which of course one is man and woman right is is somehow considered to be judgmental and that is a bad thing capital b capital t yeah. chris chris Foti reports that jerry alexander who um did, did a wonderful presentation last year and he's doing another one uh, uh, this year uh says that hollywood is now preparing to produce a feminist version of 1984 any comments on that <laughs> somebody was taking some bad drugs that day when they thought that that project up I think. wow i can imagine the final scene when <laughs> she was it julia is that the name Julia when, when is going to be threatened with rats and right. say, let it be Winston. No, let it be Winston. Okay, uh, so on. Yeah, like, that's charming. Okay, great. I look forward to seeing that movie, said he sardonically. <laughs> it's, it's, it's my favourite work of fiction by a long way. It is just, um, it was prophetic beyond words, I think. Oh, it's, it's absolutely incredible. It is. It's, <laughs> it's, not, uh, it's not going to read like a description of some year not too far into the future. Indeed, indeed. Um, Rod Lonsdale writes, um, I, I worked with a trans woman. He had the same attitudes towards masculine men that radical feminists do, just as disrespectful and happy to smear threat narratives around those men, around men, unknown to me at the time. Could transgenderism not be just seen as a developmental disorder, males, rem males raised in a feminist environment? Um, it, it, in fact, it is largely a developmental disorder in that something in the region of 80% of males who manifest gender dysphoria, as it's called, uh, revert to type uh, when left alone and not encouraged. And slightly more than 50% uh, of, of females do the same. So, but we've now got to the stage where, and this brings us back to the question about attention seeking, where one sure way to get attention is to you know, tell your parents that you're really a man or a woman, as the case may be, and now you'll, everybody will start to love you and look after you and cuddle you and tell you how wonderful you are, and especially how brave you are. Uh, mm, yes, but it is a development. I mean, it, there's something odd about it. Um, and like all of the others, dys dysphorias, like body dysphoria, it's, it's really interesting when you think about it. Nobody would say to somebody who was anorexic that you're fine as you are. You don't have a problem. Mm -hmm. Okay, why don't you eat less? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah. well, I, is... I would agree. It's it's a it's mental health problem, developmental yeah. disorder. But I think so. Why has it got more and more common? There must be something within our society at the moment that's encouraging this, that's increasing the prevalence. And I think the whole breaking down gender stereotypes, bringing up gender neutral. Sometimes in, in the very olden days, you'd turn up for school in the morning, and you'd line up in the boys' line or the girls' line. 
to go through the door that says yes. boys over it or the door that says girls over it. Okay, so that, that, that's not necessary. But on the other hand, that's starting every day, delivering the message, you're a boy or a girl. There's no ifs and buts about it. This is really straightforward. You're in this line, you're in this line. And, and did a whole host of measures like that. Did it just help reinforce children's sense of gender identity so we didn't have this flood of problems that we've got now? I, I tend to think that overall it was more helpful to have those sort of things in society. Well, well, I agree. Um, but, you know, to, let, let's take an author who's now almost universally condemned, but which many of us grew up with, that's Enid Blyton. And in her famous five stories, not the best stories, by the way, but it's all the ones that most people know about, you had, of course, the infamous George, who's actually Georgina. And Georgina wants to be a boy. And she hates to be thought of as girl, and she doesn't want to answer to Georgina. She answers to George, and she tries consistently to show that she can do anything that the boys can do. And I doubt very much if Enid Blyton herself or her audience or her publishers thought she was being sort of bravely trans transgenderist at the time. She was simply describing a phenomenon which would have been familiar to almost anyone. That is to say, uh, a girl who felt more inclined to be to do the kinds of things that boys typically did and of course there were corresponding uh, boys on the other camp we would have called them as now of course strictly on pc we would have called them sissies they would have been uh, boys who typically wanted to do the kinds of things girls did there was probably a lot more pressure by the way to prevent that happening than the other way around it was perfectly normal now we don't know because uh, and Blyton didn't write a follow-up to the famous five series we don't know what happened to georgina when she was 20 or 24 Right. But I suspect, you know, she probably married, had a husband, had children. So as happened to most people when they were left alone. Chris, Chris Voti picks um, and makes a point based on something you said, you said, you said that you were talking, you're talking about anorexic earlier, Jared. And, and he says um, there's actually a subculture called pro Anna communities that say that anorexia is a good thing. And there are some men in that, too. It, it wouldn't surprise me. I mean, it gets even more bizarre. I think I, I refer to. A phenomenon I can't remember the name it's got some bizarre uh, apotemnophilia something like this which is where people who are uh, physically intact see themselves as somehow not normal where the norm here is actually having a limb less than they have ah yes and they're actually prepared to have a limb amputated now that strikes me as being really bizarre it's very strange um so there are particular subgroups of various kinds uh, and i wouldn't i'm not surprised to hear what's just been said yes yeah. it's just the, the demand to be affirmed it's like you were saying earlier Geros, the demand to be affirmed so i i've got there's something different about me and don't anyone dare suggest this is anything uh, abnormal that it's anything problematic i just want everyone to come and pat me on the head and say it's just absolutely great the way you are, even if people can see it's going to wreck your life, mm. the nice people will come along and say, we think you're just great, just the way you are and head in the direction you're going. I mean, it's heartless, isn't it? It's heartless. It's a lack of the moral courage to it, actually it say what's going to help people. <laughs> Indeed. Indeed. It's, it's, it is, it's very strange. We've moved from a position. Let me take the issue of homosexuality, which would probably be less controversial and so on, and just to make a point here, which is this. We moved from a situation, say, in the 1960s, where homosexual, homosexuality was uh, illegal, even though perhaps the, the enforcement of it was, let's say, intermittent, and somehow non-existent, to its de facto toleration, to its decriminalization. I think okay. we're heading for compulsion, aren't we, Jared? Yeah. And 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 then we move towards the idea where now we have pride and pride, which is I mean, if, uh, my point is, if you're homosexual, I don't really care. Right. I'm not bothered. OK, yeah, I agree. But why am I now? Why are we now as a, as a society expected to validate this? I'm perfectly prepared to tolerate it. That's not a problem for me. But why am I supposed to subscribe to the idea that somehow there is something positive and so on. I, I actually was thinking of making a representation to our city council that given that we have June, I think it's Pride Week, uh, we should have the other, the other 11 months as, let's say, non-Pride Week, which would be characterized by a kind of grey, boring flag. 
Okay, no <laughs> colours on that one. No, no, no dancing. No, no. no dancing at all. So, so we, we, we see, but the serious, the serious point is you go from, if you like, toleration to validation. And yes. somehow it's not, toleration is not enough. Look, if you want to have your legs sawn off, I think that's a really bad idea. I think it's really stupid. I think there's something probably wrong with you. But I'm not going to pass a law preventing you from doing that. If you can persuade some doctor to take your leg off, I think it's remarkably silly. Okay, and you'll probably regret it. But hey, that's life. But don't expect me to subscribe to the idea that this is somehow some some entry into some brave new world. I I'm don't. Just, I'm that. just a little bit concerned that the direction of travel is gonna is gonna head towards compulsion on homosexuals. <laughs> well, so it's, it, 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 which, it may which well. Is, uh, yeah. And my father, who's dead some years now, used to joke about that. You, you mentioned about uh, people who. Um, who once have a limb removed because they don't recognize them it's yeah. a very I'm, I'm pleased you you, you mentioned that because uh, there's a fantastic book um one of the most interesting books i've ever read called we are our brains by by a dutch neuroscientist um who goes by the slightly unfortunate name of mr dick sorry dr dick swab which sounds like something you'd find in a, in a clinic isn't it um sorry for laughing and he's <laughs> <laughs> but he, uh, uh, one of the most memorable, well, he's basically saying that a lot of these uh, disorders, including gender dysphoria, um, you know, believing, you know, you know, outwardly a man, but you believe you're a woman and, and vice versa. Um, but but he, he refers to this limb uh, phenomenon. And he said he is not aware of a single instance where um, somebody with that, um, with that uh, disorder has had a perfectly healthy limb removed and later regretted it. Isn't that absolutely astonishing? You know, you, you would not think that would possibly, but but that's that's what it, that's what. Uh, There's a doctor in Scotland apparently who will perform that sort of procedure. Um, it, it's quite controversial, but it, it does happen. Yeah. Do, yeah. do you know also? I don't know if you know this. There's also an element of um, some people, for example, they will once have a leg removed, and that coincides also with the sexual attraction to amputees mm. as yes. well, and it just yes. gets really, really weird. Uh, but. There's some yeah. unusual people out there. Um, um, <laughs> Douglas writes, I had a friend who was queer. I don't know if he means gay here, but I'll probably be, I'll probably, uh, be banished to, to a desert island for even suggesting that that's what he meant. Um, and he's, he's dead now. He was so queer, I'm still not sure that he wasn't a she. But he hated the LGBTQI plus political movement. He felt that society should not prosecute him, but should not be shaped around people like him either. Since they will be listened to in the current climate, how um, how can the men's movement attract these people to be allies with us? That's a good point. I I have one or two acquaintances and friends who are, to use the current expression, gay, and they are conservative. Uh, they 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 don't turn up for the gay pride march, and so on. They they want to be left alone. And they don't want to go out with flags and buntings and shout at people and scream at people. Uh, I suspect there are quite a significant number of people in, in that situation. And uh, how we would go about attracting them, I don't quite know, uh, except to say that we probably have more common ground than you might think. Hmm. Steve Moxon asks, are, are there any cases of female to male trans individuals being called out by TERFs? Zero, I'd imagine. <laughs> zero, I'd imagine, showing fe feminist bigotry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Steve, it's great, fantastic. I, I, I'm looking. That we, we should probably check that one. There may be a single case somewhere. I don't know. Up in the, was, Richard might know that somewhere in the Shetlands, some very remote place. <laughs> uh, this, this is quite interesting. If the feminists really believe what they believe, they believe that men have got a privileged position. Yep. So really, it should be men who are complaining. You're saying, no, you're, you're not coming and sharing in our, our riches as being part of the privileged elite. You know, we're not having anyone extra in there. It should be men who are complaining. I mean, why should the oppressed group be complaining that people are coming to join them? Yeah. I mean, it's all, it's all wrong, isn't it? It just doesn't make sense. Surely if you're the oppressed group, you should say, oh, we really appreciate your magnanimity in stepping down the ladder to come and join us. <laughs> but we get you get the reverse well it i mean you know I, I do not i mean after all these years i do not know of a feminist narrative that's not one or more of five things either baseless conspiracy theory e.g yep. patriarchy theory fantasy lie delusion or myth i mean i defy anyone to tell me a single feminist narrative that uh, that actually sort of bears bears examination Doug, douglas makes the point an interesting point that transgenderism tends to go in groups a transgender person's friend and classmates are far more likely to catch the fad <laughs> 
um, than others in society. Yeah, there is a kind of social contagion, and we've seen this among the young, who are very susceptible, as you know, to peer pressure uh, on this one. And I mean, uh, to come to the point about seeking attention yet again, I mean, if you're if your friend, if 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 the girl you're best friends with suddenly comes out as transgender, and, and then she gets all of this wonderful attention, you might be forgiven for feeling a little bit out of it when uh, you're just a plain ordinary bog standard eleven year old uh, girl, and suddenly you decide, oh, this is kind of interesting. And I'm I'm not suggesting, by the way, that you would sit down necessarily and do this in a calculated fashion, but you can be attracted towards things. And and one of the things we know as human beings, we're often our motives uh, and uh, for doing things and our reasons are often opaque to ourselves. Okay, we are we are we are prey to self delusions uh, and illusions and and not knowing yourself. That's why the Greek uh, command to know yourself is so fundamental and so radical. How many of us do? One one of the attendees here, who's actually a, a speaker, I, I interviewed him for this, was 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 uh, talking about um, an incident at his school. Uh, I can't recall quite what age he was. Um, when um i think his parents bought him some sandals and he was kind of embarrassed and he said they, they, they're they going to say i'm a girl and they said and the parents said no they're not no they're not anyway so he goes to school and of course the first thing that happens is a girl says oh you're wearing girl shoes and he said well you're wearing i don't know something like um sneakers or trainers or something so you, you're a boy and he really got castigated by by the female teacher for that he said you know you don't you can't say that to girls so so he quickly got the idea that there was this sort of alternative in he, he was in the wrong half of society mm-hmm. um and 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 later expressed late, later told his parents that that he he, he thought he, he you know that he was a girl um <laughs> and, and and but but i guess i mean this was quite some years ago i think maybe 30 years ago i, I could i could be wrong um but i guess if he, if, if, if if that happened today um, everything would be encouraging to, 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 to pursue that. Let me come back to the point uh, that Richard was talking about, why it is that we haven't, why uh, female to male transgenderists, okay, are not being sort of validated or castigated indeed by the, uh, by the feminist movement. And this is, if you take the phenomenon, say, of the Berlin Wall, there weren't all that many people attempting to scale the wall from west to east, <laughs> okay, right. Uh, so if you had That's to judge, point. if you had to judge looking at it, I'm going to make you can see where I'm going on this one, right? If you had to judge which side of Berlin was inherently more attractive, <laughs> i.e., privileged, as it were, from the perspective of somebody who wanted to live in Berlin, it would have to be the West by and large. I'm not saying there wasn't some strange, bizarre person who actually tried. Well, you wouldn't actually have to climb the wall. Uh, to go from west to east, just go through the checkpoint. It wouldn't be a problem. Um, and similarly, if the men's issues, if being a man was all that the feminists say it's cracked up to be, if we're these immensely privileged beings with all of this power and all of this wealth and all of this influence and all of this society patting us on the back, why wouldn't there be more female to male transsexuals why wouldn't why wouldn't they be as they were doing what people are doing all over the world you know trying to cross the border if you like on the southern side of the united states or on the east of europe why wouldn't they be doing that and i suggest the answer is because unfortunately being a man isn't all that it's cracked up to be agreed and um i think that almost takes us to the end of the i'm sorry an interesting question here from 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 sean are social media driving hysteria? This hysteria, I guess he means. To some extent, yes. I mean, uh, the one of the things, one of the best decisions I ever made was not to go on any form of social media. Uh, I was tempted by Facebook for about a week and I rejected it. And when Twitter came on board, I, I rejected it immediately. There are a whole lot of reasons that I'd love to go into another time as to why one shouldn't be on these things. But the, 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 twi- the, the name itself, is just absurd and 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 it conjures up what's going on it's like the twittering of birds sitting outside your window on on a a high tension line and and so what happens is that because there's no effort required to apart from typing a few symbols and so on you don't have to write a letter you don't have to post it you have to send it off you don't have to engage face to face you can have this visceral emotional reaction that what we're doing is we are now on, on these social media lurching around in this sort of emotionally incontinent sea, 
okay, from, from, from crisis to crisis and wave to wave. And some people, unfortunately, especially those who are foolish enough to be on these, on these media, uh, will suffer from it. Um, it's, but I say, it's like people who, who complain about television programs. I say, there's a switch, turn it off. <laughs> Don't look at yeah, it. It's interesting. I, 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 um, I remember years ago, I, I spent maybe four or five hours on Twitter and at the end of it, I thought, what in the name of God was, what, what, how did that enhance my life in any way? Mm, didn't. Completely, complete waste of time. So I always post my blog pieces on, on Twitter, you know, um, but, 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 but never actually spend time on it. And I'm Good. not happy. And the same with Facebook. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think I've got, um, I don't know how many thousands of friends I've got on Facebook. And I think I know about five of them. <laughs> um, so, which is probably the, the, the normal. F F uh, Philip Davis always says that he has, who also spends no time on uh, on Twitter, he said he's got twenty thousand Twitter followers, and uh, they all hate him. <laughs> <laughs> That's some accomplishment. I can probably manage that with human beings. That's all. Indeed, 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 indeed. <laughs> I wonder. We, we we just have a little bit of time left, um, Jared. Um, hmm. I wonder if you'd you'd be. Uh, it's just, only just occurred to me. Uh, I wonder if you'd, you'd like to say something about. Um, I think you've been retired for a year or two now. I've been retired for five years, actually. For five years, I'm sorry. Um, and you, you were saying something to me at one time about how, your, well, your field is philosophy, how that was becoming uncomfortable towards the end. I don't know if that's something that you're, you're happy to talk about now. No, I don't mind to talk. Uh, yes, I'll talk about it briefly. I mean, for most of my time in academia, it was wonderful. Um, we, you know, among philosophers particularly, the greatest compliment you can pay in philosophy is to disagree with somebody and ask them questions about why they hold something and what their reasons for it are and so on. And... Um, towards the end of my time, I mean, I had been in the department, I'd been in the same department for almost 30 years, I'd been head for six years. So um, I wasn't, if you like, a junior at the bottom of the ladder. And suddenly, uh, this poster appeared on the wall, which said, where are the women? And I took that as a sort of veiled kind of challenge of going, well, I don't know where they, well, what do you mean, where are the women? There are women philosophers, there are not many of them, but then there are not many uh, great creative uh, musicians at the top. I don't know, I mean, there's no, there, I mean, if, you, if you're asking me, are there somehow overt forms of oppression or suppression and so on? And the answer is no, there aren't. And indeed, even at this time, the, in, in the other humanities subjects, they were all beginning to tip if they hadn't already tipped seriously in the direction of females. So psychology, 60 to 70 percent, uh, uh, social work, 95 percent. And philosophy was probably the one remaining humanities subject where there was a slight preponderance of females to males. And, and so my, when I objected to this, uh, that's when more or less all hell broke loose. And uh, I wanted that removed. And we all we had a sort of gentleman's agreement, if I can use that expression, which is you didn't. No, know well, no, you can't, uh, Jared. In, inflam <laughs> inflammatory on the walls, you could put whatever you liked on the inside of your own door. But we tried to keep the common space uncontroversial and uh, I couldn't get support. And so I was effectively isolated in the department uh, partly as a result of my own choices. But nonetheless, I was effectively isolated for the last two years or more. And that was a very sad ending to what had been. Mm a very sort of happy group by and large, as far as any group of philosophers can be happy together. I recall you, you're a lover of, of classical music, uh, oh, Gerard, yes. As, yes. As, as I am. Yes. Um, and gosh, there's so many questions would, would arise out of that. Where's, where are all the female Beethovens? But as somebody who listens to BBC Radio 3 quite a bit, um, it's remarkable how every female composer in history was underappreciated then and now. Um, so wh wh where are the female Beethovens? Well, this is the thing. And I, I go, well, what about my, my, my response to this is to say, where is George Onslow? And you go, what? <laughs> Who is George Onslow? And George Onslow was actually was the grandson of an English peer, uh, the Earl of Onslow, and grew up in France and, and, and created an astonishing body of work, mainly in the uh, chamber music. Genre. He was known as the French Beethoven to some extent. His work has disappeared almost completely and only been revived recently on CD. For, for any female composer who has been presumably neglected and discriminated against, you will find a hundred men who have a, been discriminated in the same way, who have a larger over, who have written more, uh, and been neglected to a larger extent. And one of the advantages of the, the, the CD age is it has just revealed to us just how many composers out there who are good, mm. and there are good women composers, but there aren't many. By the mm. way, there aren't, I mean, 
you know, and among the great, and my, I'm very selective, there are very few that make the tip top, they're all men. Even in the second rank with the Tchaikovsky's, they're all men. Even in the third rank with the Borodins and others, they're all men. Okay, so it's like anything else. When you, when you, when you, okay, so, so if you, if you, if you sort of have a line that represents men, women tend to be here. They tend not to be found at the very top and at the very bottom. So the men tend to be on the genius thing at the top and, and the criminal at the bottom. And the women tend to be very, very good, but not quite make it. Even in the recent world championship there I was watching, they had um, Hu Yifan, who was the women's world champion on. And she's obviously, she's a grandmaster. And she ranks, some, at the time when I wrote the book, she ranked 93rd in the world, which is astonishing. I mean, that's incredibly high. Mm. But it meant there were 92 men higher than her and among the the super gms the the, the people whose names you would see in in the uh, in the tournaments there were at least maybe 30 or 40 including quite uh, including some chinese grandmasters whom we never hear of right? and um we, we we literally have just seconds left um okay. uh, could, could just, say about it? it just shows all the tests and all the games are sexist what can so i we, say we, we need to uh, review them all <laughs> But, I but agree. Jared, just very, very quickly, Clara, I think it's Schumann, isn't it? Clara Schumann. Clara Schumann. So, a genius or criminal? Are we talking about Clara? Well, no, no, Clara, uh, Clara Schumann is a competent musician and a competent composer. She would rank in about the fourth rank for me. Okay. So, her so probably the best her... female composer ever then. But there we are, yeah. 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 Jared, it's been an absolute delight. Thank you so much for your time. It's just flown by. Um, <laughs> I, I knew it'd be a great uh, Q&A and it was a great presentation. Thank, thank you very much. And thank you, um, I yeah, think it's a you. wrap. Thank I'll you, Richard. Very good thank to you, speak to you all and good to everybody who joined in. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you.